Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today I'm so pleased to talk to Dr. Uzma Jafri. Uzma grew up in Houston, the daughter of Muslim immigrants from Pakistan and India. This turned out to be great preparation for confronting people's misconceptions about both Muslims and Texans. Today, she's a physician running her own practice in Phoenix, medical director of an assisted living and hospice agency, volunteers at a free clinic, and is co-host of the Mommying While Muslim podcast. She's also a certified speaker for the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Arizona and volunteers with multiple organizations to support refugees. Uzma considers all of those jobs to be a sideline to her real full-time occupation of being a mom to her four kids. I was so grateful that Uzma was able to find time to talk to me today about why Little Women by Louisa May Alcott is the best book ever. If you're looking for a way to help support this podcast that is free and takes up very little of your time, why not leave a review on whatever podcatcher you use? Through some sort of magical algorithm system that I don't fully understand, if a podcast has reviews, it's suggested to new listeners more often. So do it right now. Just scroll down on your phone and hit the leave a review button. It'll take just a few seconds of your time and it really helps me out. I'm super grateful for your support. Now back to the show. Hi, Uzma. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about books. (laughs) I'm so glad to hear that. Can we first talk about what a Wonder Woman you are? And I have to ask that because as a mother of four, people frequently say to me, you really do a lot of things. And I looked at your bio and went, damn! So I'm not going to, I hate the question of how do you do all this, but you really do a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. I do do a lot of things. When people ask me what I do, I tell them that I'm mother. You know, that is like how I identify um, my job. My my favorite, most important, hardest job is mothering my four kids. Now, the way I'm able to manage that and um, the other stuff that I might do in my professional or volunteer capacities is because I always chose to work part time. The initial goal was we'll work part time or I will work part time while the kids are small and that eventually when they're all into school, um, I will go back to full time work. But as they got older, you know, people had told me much wiser mothers had told me when I was a novice that you know, bigger kids, bigger problems, you know, it's kind of like bigger house, more toilets, same thing. (laughs) Um, So the bigger they get, the more toilets you're unclogging as well. So I found I, at some point, I think I realized, I think four or five years into motherhood, I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to work full time. Like they need me all the time. And, you know, after Newtown happened, um, that shooting, I realized more and more that what I wanted was to be with my kids all the time. And so that's when we really started entertaining the idea of homeschooling. And I was teaching them like that because I had learned like very didactic authoritarian teaching that is what all of our kids experience. And as I discovered more about self-directed education and child-led learning, I realized that's what I wanted for my kids. And to do that, they're all at home. I need to be here to kind of supervise and facilitate. So long story short, (laughs) in answer to your question, I work professionally part-time so that I have more time to devote to all of my other interests and passions. Amidst amidst all of the work that you already have going on, what prompted you to start your podcast? Oh, yeah, that was uh, fun. I had no idea what podcasts were until my (laughs) now co-host, who is a lifelong friend, um, called me for some help on a situation. And when I gave it to her, when I told her where she should go, um, she said, would you be willing to come and talk about that on a podcast? I'm thinking about starting one. And I was like, sure, I do it. What's a podcast? And then she was like, all right, I'm going to get back to you. You know, she kind of explained to me that there's this whole audio world where you can get your education. And me as a person who likes to smell pages, I did not understand that. Um, So I said, okay, I'll look it up. And she said she was going to look it up. And then a year went by and, you know, we both just got busy and all the part-time stuff. Because she was a stay-at-home mom, but you know when you're a stay-at-home mom, you're also busier than Mm -hmm. anybody who has a full-time job or two full-time jobs. Um, And I discovered podcasts by accident. And there was two that I was committed to. 
and just got completely addicted to and would listen to all of them. And I thought, oh my gosh, it was uh, Jen Hatmakers for the Love Podcast for me. That was like, I love everything she's doing. I love everything she's saying for women of faith. But I knew that Muslim women, you know, who are committed to their faith would get turned off by a lot of the theological conversation that was happening. You know, if you say Jesus Christ, a lot of people in my community are like, turn it off. We're not even though we believe in Jesus Christ, which is crazy. You know? yeah. So I'm like, why wouldn't you be open to that? So I said, I can do her. I can be the Muslim Jen hat maker. And so that's the mission that, you know, then I called Zeba up and I was like, I got it. We're going to be Jen hat maker. <laughs> she said, who's that? <laughs> uh-huh. so that's how the podcast started. So the assumption in the Muslim community would be if you were listening to Jen hat maker and you heard her say, Jesus Christ, you is your automatic assumption that it's going to be hostile yeah. To the, okay. Yeah. And that, um, you know, for Muslims, uh, Jesus Christ is a really important prophet and uh, the majority of Muslims believe he's still alive. And that's when his second coming is really for Muslims that, you know, they don't believe in the crucifixion and that's why Easter is not a big deal for them. Um, but, you know, in a lot of, especially in the evangelical world, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that for Muslims is sacrilegious and completely contradicts mm. their view of what monotheism is because they don't view God in any human form. Mm-hmm. So that's why they would get turned off. And I'm like, I know how to filter that because I'm an mm-hmm. adult, mm-hmm. you know, and <laughs> I can take the good out of everything. And Jen Hatmaker has so much. I, I said, okay, well, for that part of the community that I know wouldn't respond positively to her would ignore all the 99% of the perfect stuff she says for this one little detail. I was like, we can fix that. Your podcast episodes, there's such a tremendous variety. It feels very fearless to me. Mm -hmm. You've tackled, you know, religion and sexuality and hot flashes and, and, you know, homemade Ramadan and nursing. And I look at your list and I just think, is there anything you wouldn't tackle on your podcast? Is, is there anything you stay away from? No. Honestly, we've been searching for um, a mother of an LGBTQ Muslim child because we know that they exist. Mm. They have always mm. existed. But we want to show those moms because we all know those moms of those kids. And we're trying to encourage them to come and tell their story. But because there's so much stigma attached to it, I think in America still, we're still super homophobic, but within the Muslim community, there's so much homophobia that a lot of these people live in hiding. Like I know somebody personally who's waiting for his mom to die so he can come out of the closet, but he's the same age as me. So we all know it, but out of respect or not talking to his mom and out of respect or not approaching her, but I want her to feel like she has a safe place because come on, moms know, we know. You know, you're in extreme mm. denial if you don't know about things like that. And, you know, we're always in public spaces inviting. We get into all the Muslim LGBTQ um, groups and communities. But, you know, the kids are usually pretty open and they feel safe over there. But it's really hard to recruit their moms because there's still that stigma and taboo associated with it. So we have not yet found something that we are not willing to talk about, but it's often hard to get a guest to come on. We could talk about this and say that, you know, we would support any mom and whatever, um, but we really would like an insider's view because we really can't speak for them. You know, we don't know what that experience is like. Mm -hmm. Our job as podcasters, I feel a lot of time is to try to understand something that we don't know about. And we really don't know the life of LGBTQ Muslims, much less their parents. So is every conversation filtered through religion? I think everything for Muslims is typically um, filtered through faith because, Mm. you know, through their, you know, what the scariest words are on the media, Sharia law, you know, it tells you how to eat, how to sleep, how to wear clothes, you know, hygiene is super big in the Muslim religion. So like, you know, hot flashes matter, Um, you know, vaginal discharge matters, ejaculation matters. And those are really, really important things. So in terms of that, like day-to-day life, it does come up and always circling back to kind of like the oneness and conscious God consciousness is really important to Muslims. So what in our lives for a Muslim, at least is, are we not able to connect back to, okay, yeah, this thing really sucked that happened. Like this miscarriage that happened was awful, 
but what was God's plan for me? Let me try to understand that. I think that's a source of comfort, like the whole mm-hmm. God's will tenet that exists in many, many religions. I um, mean, it ex- exists in Islam too. So, you know, if our guest isn't there, um, then we try to circle her, her back. But so far, 95% of the time, the guest is already there. And she's teaching us what her religious experience was with whatever difficulty she had or whatever success she encountered. So we uh, are very clear on the podcast that we're not Islamic scholars and we're never mm-hmm. going to give any kind of rulings. And we get that a lot in our DMs. Like, mm-hmm. is it okay if I look at porn? Is it okay if I masturbate once in a while? It's like, we can't tell you. We're not qualified. We do not have those initials after our names, but we can direct you to people that you can go to. And during the actual podcast recordings, we always say that we're like, this is our experience and this is our understanding based on what we've learned from other people. Maybe what you learned is different and that's okay. You know, even diversity in how we practice our faith, we think is a blessing because we ultimately don't know exactly what's right or what's wrong. That's all in God's hands. And I think that's what makes our podcast in particular, a very safe place for Muslims who are practicing or not practicing or don't know if they're Muslim anymore, but they're raising kids and with a big question mark on their heads, like, are these kids going to be raised Muslim in America? Uh Most Muslims actually are really afraid that they're not going to be able to retain their religion. You had uh, Farina Boss on your show. I've had her on my show as well. Yeah. Um, She talked about the Witch of Blackbird Pond when she Mm -hmm. was on my show and by the way i adore her she Isn't is she fun? so <laughs> damn funny yeah yeah it was one of my favorite episodes um i thought it was so interesting that both of you mommy muslim podcasters chose these sort of classic new england american feel to them and i'm i'm quite charmed by that yeah. uh coincidence in your choices i mean I think it can be explained by the fact that there wasn't very much else. There certainly wasn't any diverse literature when we were growing up, right? So Mm -hmm. this is what we had. Um, And Little Women for me was like the first real classic book that I had been gifted because I owned one book and that was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Mm -hmm. which I read until it fell apart. (laughs) Um, I mean, we went, we had a bookmobile that would come every Wednesday to the grocery store. And so I could fill in, if I could fill the grocery bag without dropping any of the books in it, I was allowed to fill it up. And the following Wednesday, I would return every single one of those books because I read them all and I would fill it up again and take it home. So every week I had access to books and my pay, there weren't, there was no Barnes and Noble. There was Mm -hmm. no half price books. You, we wouldn't know where to go buy books except the grocery store. (laughs) <laughs> and those were like romance novels, right? So I couldn't read those. Um, so I think uh, my cousin had gifted me the Charlie and the Chocolate, Chocolate Factory. That fell apart for my 10th birthday. I got like some book about the cuckoo's nest. It was like a modern day novel. And I did mm-hmm. get my first romance novel from a friend, which I quickly threw away because I was like, I don't even know what that is. So yeah, <laughs> that was done. And for my 11th birthday, I got Little Women. Wow. And so because I had access and it was on my shelf. I won't call it a bookshelf because there weren't books on it. And my shelf on my desk, that was my book. So I read that 24 and a half times until my dad caught me reading it again and said, you're out of your mind and ripped it in half and threw (gasps) it in the garbage. And so I know, right? My father, who was like so adamant about education and literature, and we were not allowed to put books on the ground, like at a lower level than where we were seated books always have to be up high because we respect education and literature. But he was so worried about my (laughs) mental state. He was like, something's wrong. She's crazy. But at that point, the bookmobile had stopped. The program wasn't funded anymore. So I think around the time I was in fourth grade, there was no more bookmobile and the libraries were too far. Uh, Okay. Oh my God. There's so much to unpack here. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) So let's start with, so you're telling me if you sprawl out on the floor of your bedroom with a book, And then set it aside and pick up another one. Your dad wouldn't want the other book on the floor next to you. It would have to be up on your bed. Yeah. Books are not allowed on the floor. They have to be on a table or higher than where you are. Always. All books. Always. All books. Not just religious books. It's a religious book. Not just religious book. Any book. Because that is like kind of, um, uh, uh, that is education and anything you know, education is not just really important in my family. It's also really important in our religion, right? So yeah, the religious books, are, our scripture always has to be in the highest place in the house because it's like 
blessing the house. And I'm like, okay. I don't think it's blessing the house unless you're actually reading it. But, you know, um, any kind of books, whether it was school books or whatever, you know, yeah, I would when I studied um, in high school, I would move around and I know I did sprawl out on the floor. I probably had the book nearer to the ground, but like <laughs> propped up on something so I could read it. But I don't think it was out of this veneration that my parents, you know, placed on it. My dad was superintendent uh, of schools in the state in India where my dad was born and raised. And so education was super important to them. Like my grandfather didn't have a lot of money, but he had respect because he was a holder of knowledge. And books are also holders of knowledge. So for my dad to rip it up, it was like a huge like rewiring in my brain. Like, what do you, what, am I crazy really for reading a book 24 and a half times in two <laughs> years? I don't think so. So your dad ripped up Little Women, threw it in the trash. You didn't sneak back and get it? I tried. I taped it together. <laughs> he found it again. <laughs> and, you know, just the magic was gone because the binding is totally ruined. You can't just mask tape it. And I couldn't yeah. mask tape the inside. It was just, it was always falling apart. And I was just so sad. Um, and I honestly, I don't think I picked it up again until last, no, two years ago, I walked into a Christian bookstore with my son because he was looking for, they were having a curriculum sale. It was a homeschooling okay. bookstore, but very Christian based. It was funny because everybody just kind of popped up like little prairie dogs and like looked at us. And like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I was like, well, I'm here for books. Right. Um, but I found Little Women for like $1.99. And I That's said, oh my God, copy. this is my favorite book of all time. I'm going to grab it. And I just reread it in like a day. So a day and a half. And it was magical, just as magical as before. Well, tell me what it's like to reread as an adult after after loving it 24 and a half times. <laughs> Let me tell you, I was so upset that I did not have this copy earlier because, I mean, just all the lessons that Marmee teaches, especially after Meg gets married. You know, I had a really steep learning curve when I got married because I think most people do, but especially in, you know, my community where dating and abstinence is like super duper important. I know that exists in a lot of um other fundamentalist religions or faiths, um, there's this huge learning curve because you've never been with a boy. You've never lived with a boy and you make so many mistakes, but it's like how these girls grew up outside of Teddy. They didn't have a guy in their lives, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh, dang it. If I had just had this chapter, I would have known how to deal with my husband and, you know, not be the little fishwife and pick fights. And I would have understood my hormones better because the fourth trimester was really traumatic for us after our first child. And it just, we were falling apart. And I was like, oh, all these great lessons were there. Why didn't I read it? You know, I should have known better. If I had read back again about Joe, like in that, not the workhouse, but the boarding house, you know, when she's falling in love with Professor Bayer, I was like, oh, I would have recognized my husband so much sooner <laughs> if I had had that. So a lot of those lessons, I think, are timeless and they can be applied in different stages and phases of our life. I just missed out because, you know, I didn't get over my first copy of the book. I just couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't buy it again. <laughs> well, so then if you were missing out on those adult life lessons, what when you were a kid was so interesting? What what drew you to it 24 and a half times? It was Joe. It was women. Yeah. I didn't, you know, it's unspoken. You don't realize it's not coming out and saying, yeah, the title says women, but the power of that very female centric um, place this was a safe place for me and the attraction of a girl who loves to read and write like I did. You know, Joe was, I was Joe. I read an article one time that was about Meg is the best character. I always identified with Meg and it wow. stopped me in my tracks and I immediately <laughs> sent it to my best friend who is a writer. And yes. I went, Joe is the point of this book, right? Aren't we supposed to identify with Joe? And she, she replied back to me, I don't even remember the other sisters' names. <laughs> I always thought that she's the we, protagonist. Yeah. She's the one that yeah. little girls were meant to identify with because she was the one who always said to me, uh, follow the life of your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you're going to be happy. And I had no idea people identify with other characters. I, I don't get that. I think that's, you know, it speaks to Louisa May Alcott, like developing those characters so well, because, you know, there's chapters about those sisters from their perspective mm -hmm. as well, which I think is important because not everybody can be a Joe, mm -hmm. you know, and there's value in being the other sisters too, especially in the development of Joe herself. 
So you need that supporting cast of women. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't have a bazillion Joes and a bazillion <laughs> Linda Sarsours and a bazillion, you know, like Michelle Obama's. There's a whole cast of women around them that are growing them. And I think that was really this women supporting women. That's something that I've always been passionate about even when I couldn't verbalize it mm -hmm. didn't know that that's what I was reading when I was reading this book but I think that I was kind of laying the foundation for how I've lived and um, pursued relationships the rest of my life especially with women have you read any other Louise May Alcott did you read any of the like Joe's Boys or any of the follow-up books? oh yeah I read Joe's Boys um I read Little Men um, but there's a whole slew of um, novels also that she wrote. Um, I think Eight Cousins I've read, Rose and Bloom I've read, Old Fashioned Girl I've read. So like the big ones, but there's some smaller ones in there too um, in the late 1860s. And there was uh, one, The Inheritance, that wasn't published until 1997. So oh. in my defense, I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> so I'm looking right now for um, that uh, Good Wives. What are her other novels like? Um, you know, it's pretty much this, you know, obviously the, the voice is the same. Little Men and Joe's Boys is just uh, very focused on um, the house that she establishes with Mr. Bear. So it's really mm -hmm. fulfilling because it's a continuation of our protagonist, Joe's story, because there's mm -hmm. no sequel that focuses on the other sisters. Um, it's just about um, Joe and her relationship with the boys and then the individual boys. Like she really teases out their character. So we know that Louisa May Alcott, I think um, Daisy is still in there, but she's still a minor character, Meg's daughter. Um, but it's really just those boys, these orphans that she and Professor Bayer take in and they cultivate. And it's beautiful. Um, I read that once I had children because that kind of helped me on my journey to understanding how I was going to do um, self-directed education for my children, myself. And I think when I had three, so yeah, I had three kids when we went back to Boston. We were at the Children's Museum because it was too cold to be outdoors. And we saw this giant house. And I was like, what is this house? What is this house? And um, it's an orchard house. It is Louisa May Alcott's house. They have inside a giant version a of it inside the children's museum. They have a replica, like a scale model of the house. And I was like, what is this? What is this? And my husband read the placard. He's like, oh, it's Orchard House. And I was like, what is this? Uh, what is Orchard House? And then I read it. I was like, holy crap, this is Louisa <laughs> May Alcott's house. He was like, yeah, it's not far from Walden Pond. We used to go there on school field trips because he's from Massachusetts. And I was like, you must take me there. What? And he was like, what? I was like, you are taking us there tomorrow. We are clearing the calendar. I don't care who's getting married. We are going. I think we were there for a family wedding. So yeah, my kids loved it. Because you can see like what their basin was, what their butter churner was, how they like cooked. Their, their st it's still all in order. Where she wrote her desk facing the window, it was magical, magical. When you've read her other books that are not related to Joe and Mr. Bear's life, do you enjoy the... Um non little women books that Louisa May Alcott wrote I'm always comparing you know I'm like oh what would Joe have done in this situation or this <laughs> is how Amy would have handled the situation or this is what Teddy would have done instead um I, I think my initial I wasn't too happy with anything that I read I might have even cut short one of them because I was like this is nothing like little women like that was kind of my scale which I think is mm -hmm. really unfair right like nobody does that to Nicholas Sparks and you really should because it's kind of the same formula. <laughs> <laughs> so why are we holding her to that standard? You know, why is that my standard? I need to open my mind to it. But, you know, I was younger. And Have you read March by Geraldine Brooks? No. Have you heard of that? Mm -mm. Oh, my okay, gosh. Now I have to look this up. Yeah, I'm about to. Is it about the March thinking. family? Because I'm gonna... It's about him. It's about the dad. Oh. And his experiences off in war, and then when he comes back, and it's much more mature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not a it's not a kids book, okay. but Geraldine Brooks is one of my favorite authors, and it is phenomenal. Particularly if you already love the book and you just want more nuance. Yeah. yeah. To to him, especially because we don't get to know him all that mm -hmm. well. Yeah. No, he's really not. He's such a background character that I really have to think of what parts he plays. In the later books, he does kind of, I think he speaks a little bit more because he's there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it's still, I have to really think about him mm -hmm. to remember right. him because he's not super memorable. You're right. right. But in my distaste for men in a women's field, that's probably <laughs> where that comes from. Yeah. I wonder if she did any research on Louisa May Alcott's father because he was actually like, you know, one of those super maverick people that was into the um, education of children and uh, that whole movement, transcendental movement and Mm -hmm. I actually have printed out, well, I didn't print it out. I bought the poster at Orchard House <laughs> at the gift shop, his tenants for educating a child. And Louisa that's Louisa May of, Alcott's father's tenants. Yeah. I think um, it was kind of like his school was sort of a homeschool co-op. So other children would come there to learn. So it was kind of Joe's model, uh -huh. like in Little Man and Joe's Boys, is that that school is her dad's school. And did he and this, educate girls? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He also did girls. Hmm. So tell me, what are you reading these days? Anything oh. interesting? <laughs> I'm reading The Shock Doctrine. I'd have to look back at uh, the author's name, but that was recommended to me by kind of my mentor. Um, the philosophy that we teach in self-directed education for children is called unschooling in the homeschool yeah. world. Mm -hmm. um, and she was uh, teaching a colonized course because the public education system as we know it now is a result of capitalism and everybody migrating from the rural to urban areas. Where do you put the children? Because they can't run around in the fields anymore um, or plant like they do in Joe's Boys, um, <laughs> have gardens and stuff. So um, uh, it's kind of the more uh, 20th century led, led uh, destabilization of other nations that had happened and what were the experiments that provided the data that allowed our government to go do that and where that shock and awe doctrine came from because that was kind of Dick Cheney's big mantra was shock and awe. Um, so this author calls it shock doctrine and kind of traces the history of where it came from. Um, and it's kind of a tough read. So as I'm wading my way through the first 95 pages, I've also started um, The Vindication of Rights of Women by uh, Mary, is it Wollstonecraft? I know she's Shelley's mom. Okay. Right? Mary yeah, Shelley's that's Wollstonecraft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Wollstonecraft. And I immediately got turned off and I stopped reading because I realized as liberal and progressive as she is, she's still an Islamophobe. <laughs> I was like, okay, I have to step back. And you it know? comes out in that? And it comes out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, it's very okay. early on too. And I'm like, I barely started it and it's already there. And so I'm like, okay, stop. First of all, mm. I, I picked it up because I was like, I know this name from somewhere. Mm. I definitely knew the title, um, but I couldn't remember the name. And then I was like, oh, Wollstonecraft, feminist, Mary Shelley's mom. Yeah, I got it. Um, as I read the intro and then when I got into her actual work, I was like, oh, crud, you know, look at how early these roots are of Islamophobia. So that mm. was kind of hard. And I put that down. Um, and I feel like I just finished something. It was, um, it's about damn time by Arlen Hamilton, who is, uh, kind of a venture capitalist mogul right now. She's like the big thing, um, homeless to now the venture capital, capital owner of this like multi-bazillion dollar corporation that is seeding, um, black founders, particularly black women founders who other venture capitalists would not invest in. And her story is incredible. Yeah, the non the fiction that I read before that was The Stationery Shop by Marjan Karmali because I had signed up to like meet the author and it, you know I was like, well, I don't want to sound dumb in the QA, so I better read her book. <laughs> so I read it and it was really tragically beautiful. Um, and then I missed the Q and A in the presentation anyway, but oh, I had enjoyed shoot. the book. It was it was a beautiful read. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to just get more educated, and you know, for my children's sakes, I want to mm -hmm. be as well informed as I can. And I don't do a good job right now, kind of describing what my um, place in feminism is. I have always been a Muslim feminist and raised as such because regardless of how tight my dad kept me, he also gave me my wings and all of my confidence. I, I, would, I would think that he's like Louis and May Alcott's father for me, mm -hmm. um, even though he ripped up my book. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I don't do a good job of explaining it. So that's why I'm trying to get into a lot of these um, uh, post-imperialist maybe current imperialist literature and, you know, the original feminist writers and try to understand what their POV is and 
I'm starting to understand why a lot of Muslims kind of move away as far away from the feminist movement as they can, because it's not always associated with things that are in alignment with their morals or their moral understanding, I think. So I'm doing my research right now because hopefully I'm raising like three boys who are feminists and a daughter who's a feminist. So that's my goal. What's their, what are their reading preferences like? Are they, are your kids readers? I wish. Um, So my oldest is currently rereading the Harry Potters because Mm -hmm. I did say, I understand that you get to choose what you learn and we don't really have a curriculum, but I would like to see some kind of a report on what you're reading. I don't care what it is. Just turn that in once a week. So he decided to invest his time in rereading Harry Potter, but I would say his second favorite was, what was that book about the little boy? They made a movie out of it too, where he's um, got some cranial facial abnormality and wears a helmet. Uh, wonder. The, the wonder is wonder. the first one. Yeah. Yes. It's like, then it's Augie and me. And then it's like mm-hmm. the third one is the teacher's like letters to the kids or something. So he read mm-hmm. all of those and read wonder so many times because it really touched him, I think. And he's my sensitive kid who, even though like he's really loud, um, like I am and brash sometimes, he's <laughs> got a real sensitive spot. And so I think he cried, definitely cried in the movie. Uh, my second one loves everything Captain Underpants, but also loves everything Geronimo Stilton. So that's, you know, his genre. I'm trying to get him to expand because he's 11 and I'm like, okay, we need to start looking at the other stuff that's out there. Um, but he's more popular literature. My daughter is um, neurodiverse. So it's she's nine going on 10. It's a little harder for her to read at age level. So she just finished the Princess Black series, loved it. I found kind of a Muslim version of it. But it's like, it's my daughter goes, oh, it's like Princess Black, but she looks like me. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm buying every single book this author has ever written. Yeah. And I just told her, I emailed the author. I said, just let me know. She's from my hometown. So I was like, just let me know the next time you're publishing so I can pre-order everything and I will get it. And she was like, you're crazy. (laughs) Um, Which is fine. I'll do anything for my daughter. And my youngest is not verbal or not literate yet. He is learning to read. Mm -hmm. Um, But for him, he's still on those bot books. And he actually enjoys them a lot. Well, this has been so fun talking to you. I'm so delighted you came on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I so appreciate talking about my favorite book in the world. I I love it. I will never get over that story of your dad ripping it. <laughs> ripping of my book, yeah. I've Apparently never you're not supposed to read a book more than point. once. I don't know. Oh, that just hurts my feelings. I think part of my um, therapy from what I experienced with this book, uh, the ripping of it at least, is everywhere I go, I will buy books. Like that's when I look at my credit card bills, that's what I'm doing. Do you have a I good... Books. Indie bookstore in Phoenix. Do you have yeah, a favorite there? What, yeah. what is it's it? It's called Changing Hands Bookstore. Oh, cute name. Yeah, it's a very cute name. And it's great because there's a lot of local authors that will come and, yeah. um, you know, do their book readings or kind of like, uh, what's it called? Book debuts, the book mm-hmm. party, book launch parties, right? So they'll do that over there. It's, it's a really nice place. Why don't you share where our listeners can find you and your wonderful podcast and all that you do online? Oh, great. Um, So we are mommying while Muslim. That's M-O-M-M-Y-I-N-G. Don't ask me why we did that. I thought we could have done it easier, but we're mommying. We made it a verb. Uh, While Muslim podcast, we're on all the podcast platforms. You can, you know, I think we're on Alexa and Audible now too. Amazon Music has us if you have a subscription to that. Um, And you can find find us at mommyingwhilemuslim.com as well. That's our website with all of the stuff we're doing. Um, And yeah, we're on Instagram at mommyingwhilemuslim podcast. So hope to see you guys there. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about I think my only hobby, (laughs) reading. (laughs) It has been my pleasure. I'm so glad that you joined me. Thank you, Isma. Thank you. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks for listening, bookworms. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, please go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com, or follow the podcast on Instagram at bestbookeverpodcast. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie Wrote a Book. Remember, when you're doing your book shopping, please help support indie bookstores and this podcast by using my affiliate link at bookshop.com slash bestbookever. Thank you for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.